is funded by an IMLS grant that we received uh, in support of the Library Diversity Institute series. And we will be doing, a, a, uh, as part of the project, a series of webinars on topics related to library diversity residencies. Today we have Nikot Goss presenting on the topic, Support, Development, and Supervision of Resident Librarians of Color. Uh, to this topic, recruitment of resident librarians in the university library residency programs has increased significantly since the establishment of the Diversity Alliance in 2015. The recruitment of librarians of color into predominantly white spaces brings to surface issues of support and development of these new employees. This webinar will discuss how resident coordinators can support these new hires with the onboarding, acculturation, and understanding of a potentially unfamiliar organizational culture. Additionally, we'll look at how these resident positions go about supporting the goals of the organization while helping residents gain marketable skill sets with the goal of developing librarians of color who retain or retained within academic library, libraries. About our presenter today, Nikhat Goss is Associate Librarian for the Social Sciences to the College of Arts and Sciences and the coordinator of the Diversity Alliance Residency Program at American University. In addition to her Master's in Library and Information Science from the University of Pittsburgh, she's earned a Master's of Science in Organizational Development from AU and as an Organizational Develop Development Independent Consultant specializes in change management, diversity and inclusion, student development and facilitation, particularly within academia. Nikop's research explores inclusive organizations utilizing the principles of organization development, as well as mentoring and information literacy instruction, particularly to diverse and international student populations. Nikop is an alum of the Association of Research Libraries Leadership and career development program 2011 to 12. So over to you, Deborah. Okay, uh, one last time for some logistics for the people who are just coming in. Uh, please mute your audio if you are not already muted uh, by clicking the audio icon next to your name uh, to turn it red. But feel free to turn it back on at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with uh, Nick Huck. If you do not have a microphone, you're also welcome to participate in chat throughout. Um, there will be a time um, for a Q&A session at the end. Um, again, if you have any technical issues, please email me at deborah.caldwell at uncg.edu, and we will guide you through some solutions. But please do not clog up the chat with tech support questions. And worst case scenario, please remember that this session is being recorded and will be available um, at a later date. Uh, so before I introduce, or before we get going, do we have any questions at this time? Going once, going twice. All right, Nick, it's up to you. Okay, well, thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Dr. Hilbert. Um, let's see if I got this right. Okay. Um, so I'm Nick Huff, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Gerald Holmes for asking me to help with this webinar series. Um, so our agenda, briefly, is to, to talk about organizational culture, the context of our work, and to provide some uh, resources for support, development, and supervision uh, of, of resident librarians, and uh, to speak briefly to research and service uh, for resident librarians, and then make time for your questions. So, with regards to organizational culture, um, this is probably the only piece that is not about resident librarians, but about library culture and culture in general. Um, when we talk about organizational culture, um, it's, it's hard to explain organizational culture. And it's uh, one of the questions that I ask when I, when I would interview for jobs. How would you describe your organization's culture? And how do you describe a culture to your new employees, uh, and in this case, to new resident librarians? Um, so an organizational culture is a property, is the property of groups. It's an acquired history, and it's an accumulated uh, learning. But only a portion of that accumulated learning um, is passed on to new mem members. And I have echo. Um, so an organizational culture uh, is a 
is a, a pattern of basic assumptions. And the basic assumption is described fundamentally as what individuals assume to be a part of a group. Um, so if you think about a new employee um, and they're, they're going to assume that they're supposed to be at work at 8 a.m. And then they get there at work at 8 a.m. and not everybody's there. In fact, we have a flexible um, schedule. So you can come in anywhere between 8 and maybe whenever. And until if that's clarified, it's an assumption that an empl new employee makes. So that's one example. Um, the stability of a group is based on how integrated uh, the strength and to what degree they are into a culture. So for a new librarian or a resident librarian, um, that will take some time. Um, and the length of time a group has existed, the depth of learning and how that learning has taken place, um, for example, positive reinforcement or versus negative reinforcement, and finally, the assumptions held by leadership of that group. Um, so, so when we talk about the culture of an organization, these are some of the things we take into consideration. Um, so as a group learns to cope with uh, change, for example, this is some things that we, we will consider, um, how an individual takes that change as a part of a group. Um, so what you see on our slide here is an example of a, a visualization of an organizational culture. Um, there are artifacts within an organization, there are spouse values, and there are underlying assumptions. So the artifacts, um, they're a characteristics of an organization that can be easily seen, um, heard, or felt by individuals. Um, so an example would be a new employee during the first week. They can visibly see, um, but not necessarily easily interpret what's going on unless, you, unless they were to ask a seasoned colleague about that. So this is sort of surface level uh, organizational culture. So the next level is espoused values, and, and this is uh, deeper than surface level. The values of individuals within the library play a role in deciding organizational culture. The thought process and attitudes of employees have a deep impact on the culture of any um, of any particular organization. So things like goals, ideals, norms, um, moral principles, and other untestable premises. Um, and once you dig deeper into spouse values, you'll notice there are inconsistencies, anomalies, um, and they're harder to explain, especially to new employees. Um, the next is underlying assumptions, and these are unconscious beliefs, um, and they may have they historically, these are values that have stood the test of time and have become assumptions or have been taken for granted. And it stops being a, a question. It's not uh, something that can even be challenged in some cases. Assumptions can become dangerous when they are not unlearned. And regardless of how the group or organization changes, um, it's, it becomes, um, assumptions are, are can also be learned from traumatic experience or traumatic events. So let's say uh, a change uh, event occurs in, in an organization and it's jolting and that becomes an impact factor. And the assumption that builds from that is that might, that might be that change is bad and change is traumatic for that example. Um, and so an underlying assumption is deeply entrenched and difficult to surface and change. So with that in context, um, how does that, how do, you, how do you become aware of these things, especially with new employees and new resident librarians? They're, they're here for a few years, two, three years. Um, and Um, and how do you describe an organization's culture to a new employee? And how do you explain um, meetings, for example? And how do you explain um, awkward moments in meetings? Um, and the other context is that um, the sociocultural context of academic libraries being inherently white. Um, and that's 
that is not something that we question. This is, this is an underlying assumption of academic libraries. They're built on whiteness. Um, so those are things that we need to consider as we hire librarians of color into these, uh, into these positions. Um, so having the opportunity to explain and clarify issues, um, especially things like uh, events that occur in meetings, difficult conversations, and um, of course, microaggressions that may be experienced or seen um, by resident librarians. And I'll go a bit more into that in just a bit. So with that in mind um, of an organizational culture, how do you plan for uh, a new librarian and how do you get the benefits of having a new employee and and also benefit the new employee. Um, so one of the first things that um, my organization, we thought about is creating an onboarding plan. Um, and this is still probably, actually, yeah, it's probably still in an in, in ongoing development. Um, so as you hire, have a plan in mind. And, and as they are hired, update that plan to reflect the needs of that individual. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a bit more in just a bit about an organization's need versus what an employee might need from this residency. But things to consider with our new employees is that some of them may be completely new to academia. Others may have significant experience working in academia. Um, other may have prior experiences of working within or outside of academia, and all of those experiences are relevant. Um, keep in mind that our residents are not blank slates. They come from other fields. They have their own experiences. One of my residents actually reminded me of this. Um, she comes from teaching high school for the last six years. So the last thing I need to develop for her was teaching skills. Um, and in fact, she's actually been more helpful with my colleagues and, and I for, for, from learning from her experiences as a teacher um, because we spend a lot of time working with first year students and she has been working with high school students for the last six years. And so that knowledge has been great. Um, so one last point uh, is the residency is a development program. So we've hired on these individuals to develop them. So the opportunity to gain the skill set to be able to be a viable candidate for a permanent position. Uh, it might not be at the organization that they're at, but my position is if we are going to hire someone for three years, then we want to give them as many opportunities and CV builders that, that is humanly possible that they can manage. Um, so with that comes support. So with new environments, um, support means having systems in place for residents, uh, especially for onboarding and for, um, for, for work that is, uh, that is semesterly and um, consistent. So uh, one example would be having a network of support can it, uh, help accelerate new librarians. And I'm on the wrong slide. Um, can help ex help uh, accelerate um, a new librarian's integration into the, the system. Um, so, for example, um, introducing them to colleagues, introducing them to potential mentors. Um, and um, when I was working on my organization development degree, I was working with one client system, and one of the questions we would ask that client system of their employees was, "Do you have a best friend at work?" And, and if we think about it, we all, to some degree, have a best friend at work. Someone we trust, someone we respect, someone who's a colleague, and someone we can go and ask uh, that question of, uh, you know, what we consider, what we might consider to be a dumb question. Um, so that's, that helps acclimate a new employee and helps them concentrate on the work as well as makes them feel welcome. Um, and I think one area that we're particularly challenged with is having clear, direct documentation about what the role of the resident is. And I think that helps both the organization and the employee 
um, get to 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 what it needs to be done. Um, so with my organization, for example, um, we are a teaching heavy uh, uh, university library. We spend a significant amount of time teaching information literacy. So our residents are hired for that purpose. Uh, the, our position description clearly states your primary responsibilities will be to teach information literacy to incoming first year students. Um, and a clear timeline, and this goes a bit more towards the resident, is a, a clear timeline of the work. So um, my residents know that fall semester, they're going to be doing a lot of teaching and probably very little research outside of maybe reflection on what they want to do for their research agenda. Um, but with all of that um, comes some of the issues of um, being the only person of color uh, or one of the few and the labor that comes with that, whether it's um, known or unknown, whether it's uh, conscious or unconscious, um, that work in particular can be difficult work and can take away from doing the job. Um, and so there needs to be an awareness that librarians of color manage this on a daily. It's not something that occurs every once in a while, but it's something that we are dealing with on a, on a daily basis. Um, even something as simple as that title of resident is, is emotional labor because all of my librarians, I've, I've only had three, so, um, and hopefully four soon, all of my, my resident librarians have had to explain um, what a resident is, and then they've had to explain um, that they, yes, they are a degreed librarian um, to other librarians. Um, and some of my librarians are on the young side, or they look visibly young, but um, I think the first eight uh, founding members, uh, residents, they ran the age uh, groups around age 24 to 35. So these are skilled professionals that we've hired. And just giving them the credit due is, shouldn't be something that they ask for. And I think that's where um, the authenticity piece comes in. If we have to justify being there, um, librarians of color will not be their authentic selves. It's hard to do that when you're when your presence is questioned. Um, so the last piece that I wanted to talk about was a quote. Um, Katsali is uh, my first resident librarian. And I've only actually been a supervisor for the last two years of the program. And the first year, uh, in 2015, um, I was actually Katsali's mentor. And um, I was emailing back and forth with her and she emailed back this piece to me and I asked her if I could quote her. So for her, the, uh, this is where I, I think I have a couple of soapbox issues, this is one of them. Um, the case for mentoring, um, that is going to be very important. Um, I skipped over it because I wanted to talk about this quote in particular. Um, Katsali speak, spoke to me about um, my, my mentorship to her. And, and I think I play both roles, and I'll talk about this a bit more under supervision, but as a supervisor, I am a coach, I am a supervisor, I am a mentor. And depending on the situation, the example, the problem, I put on one of those hats. Um, and she left this residency to work at Tufts University. And um, she went from a research two organization to a research one organization. And I know she's going to succeed. And she went from having uh, interest working with first year students um, to having a professional interest in being a subject librarian. And she got that opportunity because a colleague of ours was unavailable for a few months. And she became the interim uh, librarian, and I can't remember what it was for. Um, but she, Oh, education, there we go. We, we had a colleague who left and she was the education librarian for the summer for about four or five months. 
and that experience cemented the fact that she wanted to work in subject librarianship. Um, and that's also the case for my second librarian, Avery. Um, he was really challenged by being in the interim business librarian for the last few months. He's still uh, ongoing. I think it's been six plus months now. Um, and that challenge cemented his interest in continuing to work in subject librarianship. Um, and he's going to be doing that in January as a music librarian for UNLV. So I mentioned earlier um, development and organizational goals. So I think residencies are wonderful opportunities for librarians, but organizations need to benefit from this work as well. And I think one of the cool things about libraries is that we're kind of cyclical. We know what to expect in fall, we know what to expect in spring to most degrees, and we know what to expect in summer. And with that in mind, we can look and identify short-term projects or goals, long-term projects and goals that will benefit the organization. And as we look to hire resident librarians, we look to match up our needs to professional interests of resident librarians. Um, and I think that should be something we all consider so that we're not just hiring someone because it's a cool thing to do. We're hiring someone to, not, to fill our needs and to maybe justify faculty lines or to finish up work that um, others aren't able to do at the moment. Um, and the other opportunity is, um, at, I'm a mid-career librarian, more or less. I've been a librarian for 18 years. Um, and when the opportunity came to supervise other librarians, um, I was excited about that. And I don't think that opportunity would have come um, if this, this resident program hadn't come to fruition. Um, so that is an opportunity to look at your, uh, your colleagues and say who would be, um, who's interested in growth and who wants to grow in this area um, and develop mid-career librarians into, in, who are interested in working up to that next level. Um, and again, with the long-term goals, I mentioned how with AU, all of our subject librarians are, have a heavy teaching load. Um, and if a resident librarian can help a, re a subject librarian teach some of those classes and gain experience, that leaves a, a subject librarian time to do other work. Um, and that's something that we should consider. Um, and so those are opportunities for organizations to, to look at, um, to see where there is growth, uh, whether it's for supervising, for mentoring, and for coaching and for um, other projects that need completed and hire for our needs and not just hire for, um, for the sake of hiring. So uh, um, all of our resident librarians had a professional interest in teaching um, and had an interest in growing in that area. Okay. So with regards to the employee, um, you know, three years is a significant piece of time and it's short technically in a residency but in a professional career it's a lot of time to take away uh, to gain skills that aren't necessarily learned in grad school or on the job as a part-time librarian or as a GTA. Um, so this delayed start, the residents have chosen to, uh, to delay their careers for three years and it's not always by choice. Um, these are the jobs that are available to them. Entry level jobs are far and few between and a residency gives them the skills they need to apply to permanent positions and within that residency they have gained the research, the, the skill sets that are required, the practice and the polish to be able to apply for uh, for positions that ask for three to five years of professional experience. They qualify for that versus um, a, a newly minted degree librarian. Um, but at the same time, this is frustrating. You put off three years of your life um, and your classmates have moved ahead of you. 
and and they've moved ahead in their career trajectory and and we know this and we notice this um, and this can impact earnings and it can impact uh, uh, your professional growth um, and it, it's it's challenging um, you know um, and I think I forgot to mention I am a former resident librarian in 2001 to 2003. Um, after working uh, for um, the University of Pittsburgh as a grad student, I was hired on for a year there. And after that, I worked for a small liberal arts college for two years as a resident. So that was a little over three years as either a temporary librarian or a resident librarian. And then I got a tenure track librarian job, which I was not ready for. But I worked very hard to get tenure at that organization. Um, so that is something to be aware of. And so if someone is willingly to giving you three years of their professional career, um, we really need to make the most out of it for them. Um, and I, I do have another soapbox conversation, um, rotations. Um, I believe we need to be careful with rotations. Um, if at the end of two years, a resident does not have a clearly defined area of professional interest, um, then we need to figure out how to support that individual, identify and develop tangible skills so that they can be marketable in their last year. Um, and I think in the next slide, I'm gonna talk about benchmarks and um, I can actually uh, forward that document that I created for our residents. Um, so I really believe the last year of a resident's uh, program should be development of a librarian for marketable skill sets. That includes updating a CV, telephone interview skills, interview skills, and presentation skills. Um, those things need to practice. They cannot be learned just because they're, you're teaching. Um, that's a completely different skill set, um, and it's a completely different um, interview and most residents that first interview they do to interview for the resident librarian um, that's their first time interviewing potentially first or second or third and that in itself is a challenge when you have no idea what to expect um, but I really think if you're going to commit three years of your life then there should be a benchmark in place and an expectation of the work you're going to do and how you're going to move forward into, uh, into the field. And this is all about retention as well. If we can't make these individuals marketable, then what are we doing? So the next would be uh, supervision. So, and I mentioned earlier that I sort of play a, a, a little bit of this and that for every librarian. Um, so, to degree, I coach my librarians. Um, I ask more questions than I do provide answers. And a lot of this is their own reflective work and to be able to figure out things for themselves. These are adults. I don't need to give them answers. Um, um, so the benchmark document that I created uh, with um, actually Katsali, my first resident librarian, um, broke down uh, what, to, what a resident should be completing by their third month as a librarian, their sixth month as a librarian, uh, within their first year, within, their, within the first 18 months, and within the first 24 months. Um, and the last year of that is basically training for, for job opportunities. Um, and I'm happy to uh, share that document and maybe I can send it to Deborah and she can connect it to the, this PowerPoint. Um, uh, coaching, especially, especially with difficult situations, whether they're observed or experienced, um, with, depending on the resident, I've worked, I've asked them to, to, to respond to that scenario. Um, so let's say, for example, they're working with a difficult professor and instead of um, giving them answers, I will ask them what do, they want, what do they want to do. And if they don't know, I can suggest options and then we can discuss what those options are and what's best for this situation. 
Um, each of my residents, I highly encourage them, yeah, more like require, uh, short-term goals and, sh and long-term goals. So uh, my newest resident has been here about five months. Um, and she and I are discussing short-term goals for the next year, or sorry, long-term goals for the next year, uh, with particular her research and service agenda, um, which will be the next slide. So, um, so I've had them look at what they want to accomplish. Um, so for this resident, uh, she is uh, new to service and research to some degree. Um, and service, trying to figure out what committees and, and how to apply to those committees, that information is not easily available on the websites in some cases. And so helping her find that information, helping her select out what committees she might be considering and to helping her decide what the timeline is for that. Those are um, examples of support that we can provide as a supervisor. I'm not doing too bad, okay. Um, let's see if I missed anything. Uh, tools and support. Um, one of the things that, and I think I talk about this in the next slide, one of the things that this organization has been really generous about is providing uh, professional development support to our resident librarians, um, and particularly for uh, conference attendance and professional development. Um, so our residents have gone to to a, a number of conferences and either and I've always encouraged them to at least try to present or apply so that they have that experience behind them. Um, so that's my first encouragement and then if by chance they don't get in they can still attend the conference. Um, but the effort still needs to be there for the practice of applying to a conference, for the practice of, of creating an abstract within a deadline, within the other workload that they're managing. Um, but conference attendance, I think, is really uh, important so that these somewhat isolated residents can have the opportunity to meet other residents and have those conversations that aren't necessarily um, that they can't necessarily have with senior librarians or, or people who just don't necessarily have their experiences. Um, and I, I do want to thank our university librarian. She's been uh, very generous with her support and she is very encouraging to resident librarians to, up to apply to conferences um, in particular. Uh, so we, I spoke briefly about what my newest resident librarian um, and, and service. So uh, our residents are term faculty, and that means they have commitments to not just professional responsibilities, but to research and to uh, service. So, um, so that means they are automatically members of the library faculty assembly, and they get to see that engagement and those conversations of the issues that library faculty are dealing with. They have the option to find a, a local uh, DCALA or um, neighboring uh, organizations uh, and join that, that association. Um, I think almost all of my committee uh, residents have joined a national committee, whether it's ALA, Music Library Association, ACRL, or RIG, um, which is the Residents Interest Group, I believe, which, which is under ACRL. Um, one of the things um, a couple of my residents have mentioned is being uh, on, on the search committee is one of their best experiences and to have that background and experience of the hiring process from 100 applications all the way to presentation and selection of a candidate, um, that has been some of their most valuable learning so that they can see what is happening as they're applying to jobs, this is their experience and they can have context and connection to the work. Um, one of the other things that um, I work with my residents on and, and still a work in progress is encouraging them to uh, create teaching statements and uh, research statements. Um, and with some of the positions that they're getting, um, they will be creating these statements. They will be tenure track and they can begin that here, and of course it will change and grow. Um, but having 
a draft of these to work from versus having no knowledge and starting from scratch is um, that's a bit more challenging in a tenure track line than it is with a, uh, a no stress situation of, of investigating other statements and being curious about your colleagues work and their philosophy for teaching or for their research and how that ex it ex is explained in their files. I think it's, it's important. Um, so I think that's about all I have. Um, do you have any questions for me? Oh, I should find the chat box. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes, okay. Um, okay, well, um, rather than unmuting everyone so that we have all the background noise filtering in, um, you should be able to unmute yourselves. And if you can't, just ping me a chat and um, I'll unmute you. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions for the cut? Um, yeah, sorry, can you see it from Danielle? It says, can you talk about the recruitment process? Uh, with regards to the position description or? Uh, she says both. Okay. So I don't think we do a whole lot of recruiting, actually. But we're also in a, a pretty prime location of Washington, D.C., so we're fortunate. Um, uh, when I do get a position description that I can post, I post it to, uh, uh, to the listservs, to Facebook posts. Um, I connect with colleagues in the caucuses and make sure that that position is advertised. Um, and my residents also, you know, they speak about their experiences and that in itself is really the best advertising. Um, that one can have, and, and it's free advertising. Um, so those are all, um, I think on average, we've gotten about around 100 applicants each year. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, yeah, she said yes, thank you. I'm sorry, some of these people are, it defaults to private, so I think there's some questions coming in that you can't see, so if you're okay with it, I'll go ahead and read them out to you. Sure. Um, I'm going to, hang on, it's a little difficult to see. Okay, um, so recruitment, okay. Um, the next question was about the rotation process. Okay. Um, so Mallory wants to know if you can talk about the rotation process at your university. I don't have one. You don't have one, okay. Um, for this organization, it's not viable. Um, we have an immediate demand for teaching, and that pretty much starts late August, and it doesn't stop until mid-November. Um, do the residents get an introduction to the other departments? Yes, they do, but it's more along the lines of half a day. Mm -hmm. um, to hours to half, to half a day at the maximum. And if they're, they show interest in this, that, and the other, I'll work with them to, within their schedule to, to get those opportunities. Okay. Um, okay, so there are a couple people asking, or I think maybe repeat questions. Um, do you have any suggestions for those who would like to start a diverse, am I muted? I'm not, okay. Do you have questions for those of us who would like to start a diversity program at our institution? Um, look at what your organization needs first. And then look at your organization in the context of how can you support a single person of color or continue to support the few people of color that you have at your organization. Okay. Um, next question is uh, from Jade, similar to Danielle, I'd like to know if you have any ideas of how to make your institution or program stand out from others? Um, I think it's just doing good work and doing good with your residents, for your residents. Um, reputation precedes us. And my residents tell me that they're fortunate to be at this residency and 
to have the opportunity to work with me. And I think one of them is on here. I might put him on the spot and let him chime in. Um, but that that's something that we have to develop. Uh, we have to be aware of, of the different needs and we have to work towards supporting them. And we have to ask, what is it that you need from us? Hope that answered your questions, Jay. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Next we have, uh, do you have any advice on navigating multiple roles in relation to the resident, as coach, supervisor, and another person of color? Um, I think mentoring after Katsali, I stepped back a little bit. I mentor to the context of the, the problem or I coach to the context of the problem. Um, and I encourage my residents to, to find mentors within our organization. So I think um, one of my residents has a good connection with one of my colleagues and they're always knocking on, on their door to chat with them and I think that's great. Um, so if your organization doesn't have a formal mentoring program, that might be something to consider especially if you're a tenure, tenure track organization, most of those organizations have something like a mentoring program. So take advantage of that, uh, cultivate mentors, um, and therefore create the space to, to mentor new employees and mentoring resident, li resident librarians. Okay, thank you for that. And also there's a, a note here from Mary Caldera um, that I didn't see earlier saying that um, for her residency, she consciously stayed away from rotations for probably precisely the reasons that you mentioned. Thank you. Um, okay, next we have, uh, do you have any uh, suggestions or do you have any comments on the pros and cons of a two-year versus a three-year program? Um, it depends on the resident. Um, I think it's doable. My second resident is in a two-year residency program. Um, it's a bit compressed, so you have to hire a candidate who, who really wants to, who really wants growth at an accelerated rate. And you also have to have an organization that's going to offer that resident the opportunities to grow. Um, and I think I I'm, I'm missed this on the, the slides, but, um, you know, giving residents, oh, it was one of my soapbox issues, I completely missed it, terribly sorry, um, getting, getting residents real work and not busy work, because um, they're not graduate students, they're not interns, and you can't give them capstone work, that's undergraduate terminology. Um, so that language in itself is problematic, and it's like, it's almost insulting to the resident. Um, so give them real professional work. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a question that I was just asked by um, Tasha, Tashia, um, that I'm going to skip ahead on questions because that ties along right in with what you just said, which says, what advice can you give to a resident if they're stuck in an organization that hired just to hire and no program was fully developed? Um, build your own program. My residency, in 2001, um, I was told a few weeks after I was hired, I had the responsibilities that nobody else wanted. And I made the most of it. So find your opportunities, ask for them. Okay, um, let's see, I've got two more questions. Um, what are the top three things we can do to make our residents feel welcome? I think that would be organization specific. Um, I don't think there's one single response. Uh, you really have to look at your organization and you have to consider um, one, how many librarians of color work within your organization. Librarians of color are few and far between within academic libraries. So that's, that's the first level of awareness. And, and if there are more than five in your organization, then um, are those librarians willing to support other librarians of color? Because that's labor. Um, do they have the time? Do they have the space? Um, and if it's not them, are your colleagues willing to support other librarians of color? Um, and, and that can be really hit or miss. Um, yeah, I just want to comment that 
gosh, like when you said if there's more than five, I was like, ah, oh, it's such a low bar, but it's so true that we have to set our expectations so low. I, mean, I work with about 20 librarians, and I think there's five or six of us of color here, and that's like the most I've ever worked with. My previous organization, I was four or five, depending on the year, out of 150. Wow. Uh, FTE, not librarians. Yeah. So I think there were like 50 librarians at that organization, roughly. Does that answer your question? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat yet, but if they have further follow-up, uh, feel free to go ahead and put that in there or unmute yourself. Okay, yes, they said yes, thank you. Um, and the last question that I saw, and if I missed any questions, please go ahead and just pop them back into the chat. Again, I think I went through and got everything, but if I missed anything or if you have any follow-up, feel free to go ahead and add that in there. We've still got some time left. Um, so this comment is from Sarah. Uh, and it is, did you see the recent criticism of residencies in American libraries, um, which basically amount to why don't we just hire librarians of color for permanent positions intentionally? Um, why create special positions which can't be tokenizing? Um, how can we make residencies truly transformative to be more valuable than three years in an entry level position? What are your thoughts on this perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, that has to do with organizational culture and search committees. Search committees and organizations don't see librarians of color as, as librarians, at least not yet. Um, there was a Harvard Business Review article um, talking about um, if you only, what was it? If you only interview one woman or, or candidate of color, it's statistically impossible for that individual to be hired. And this was in a corporate environment. So translate that to an academic librarian where it's predominantly white women. Um, how do you hire a librarian of color if you can't compare them to the other candidates? Because that's not happening. Thank you. I think I found the article you're talking about in case it's for anyone interested. Good skill. Um, so we have to look at ourselves. This is an organizational issue. It's not um, the residency is a bypass. Thank you for that. And then we've got another one from Mary Caldera, which says um, ideas about connecting residents from across programs. Um, and after you're done, Nick, uh, Nick, we have um, maybe we can comment on that as well. Yeah. Well, actually, my comment would be the Diversity Institute uh, hosted by UNC uh, Greensboro. Um, my residents came back really connected with other colleagues, and they have built a support system within themselves. And I think that is something that is necessary. That's outside of their bosses. That's outside of the organization. That's outside of oversight. Um, and let them have those, those conversations about the issues that they're managing and let them figure out their own solutions. Did you want to add anything? Sarah? Sure, we can, we can add. Thank you for the shout out. Um, I'm so glad that your, <laughs> your residents had a good time here. Um, that was also, um, I'm brand new and this is, I'm the library diversity resident here at UNCG. Um, and I just started last month and I got to kick off everything by um, um, clearing my calendar and rushing over to the Institute right after <laughs> I was offered the position, like the weekend after. Um, so that was a great way for me to kick off my resident experience, personally speaking. Um, but Dr. Halbert is here, um, and I think maybe he can give, uh, he can speak a little bit as to what the Institute is, just to answer your question, Mary, if you're unfamiliar with what, or anyone else who's listening with what the Institute is, um, and the methods that we develop to keep uh, residents from the Institute connected. Dr. Halbert? I'm, I'm gratified. Uh, Nikon, that uh, your residents came back with that experience. That was exactly what we had hoped to foster in the course of the Institute. And the Institute, I should say, uh, as funded by IMLS, was specifically designed to address the two, uh, at least as far as the Institute proper program, part of the program, uh, the Institutes were designed to address the two biggest needs of expressed needs of residents. One, the lack of a larger network of colleagues of other residents in a, in a larger context or being aware 
of uh, the experiences and issues that other residents are encountering. And then secondly, uh, to give them the experience and skills uh, from people who like uh, Jason Alston, who I think was on the call earlier. I don't know if he's still here. He is. Uh, who, has, who has studied uh, this question very, I mean, it was the topic of his uh, doctoral uh, work to study success factors in um, residencies. And um, the program, it hosted the first uh, institute as part of the LDI, the Library Diversity Institute's program this year. We will host another one next year. Please get in touch with us if you have a uh, likelihood of a resident coming on board next year. And uh, we are also working with the ACRL Diversity Alliance to sort of mainstream in an ongoing way the notion of institutes for residents nationally. Yes, so um, in the next year, there will be a website and other um, information forthcoming. But in the meanwhile, Mary, um, those of us who are at the Institute, um, we have a listserv that we've been using to communicate with each other, which does have a fair amount of activity. Um, and um, if you are interested in uh, being connected with that, or maybe if you have some other ideas um, regarding that, we would certainly love to uh, be a part of that. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? We've still got eight minutes, or we can reclaim eight minutes of our time today. Give it a minute or two. It takes time to type things. <laughs> any wrap up thoughts, Nikat, from the questions that have come up? Um, I think it's wonderful that. Um, University libraries and colleges are considering residency programs, and I think there's, I think literally double digits uh, of universities doing, moving towards this work and creating these opportunities. Um, and I go back to that comment in that article that I will now dig up and read. Um, we really need to start looking at our organizations, and we need to look at the inherent whiteness of our organizations, because if we can't be a part of a regular job interview process. If we're not considered as a librarian, even from CV or from on-site interview, then how, how are we going to reflect the populations we're serving? Thank you for that. And then we do have um, Jonathan wanted to reiterate the second part of his earlier question. How can we uh, make residency truly transformative to be more valuable than three years in an entry level position? Hire them after you after they're completed. And, and if you're a tenure track organization, give them credit for uh, time served. Um, that would be my snarky comment, but in reality, um, that would be ideal, and some organizations have actually done that. Um, how can you make residencies truly transformative to be more valuable than three years? Um, I'm not sure. I think residencies in themselves, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gap measure, right? So doing giving your residents the best opportunities, not busy work, not note-taking, not um, capstone work, uh, but substantive, substantive CV developing professional responsibilities. Um, and that will retain them. Yeah, I just wanted to go ahead and uh, make uh, make a comment on your, your comment regarding tenure um, and circling back around to institutional culture and for having residents who are often, you know, as people of color, generally first generation students, not familiar with all of this higher ed stuff. Um, I had, went through my orientation just a few weeks ago um, and things about like, you know, tenure track, rank, you know, retirement benefits. I'm like, I don't know what these words mean. You have to put yeah. things down and really, really give me, it would go to the bare bones basics for me because I, this is the first time that I've even conceived of the possibility of a retirement plan that wasn't just, you know, the collapse of society. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, like, I going down into the bare bones basics of what it means to be in higher ed. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, um, I forget the term for it when you when you've been at something for so long and you forget what entry level information is. Um, I think people. Habituation. Yeah, something like that. Habituation where um, people, you know, even the best intention people don't realize that they're speaking at a level that the person they're talking even when they're trying to be welcoming maybe doesn't necessarily understand because they have such little familiarity with that culture um so uh, yeah the tenure to, I, I wonder how many you know recent uh like uh, graduates of library school um, and um, current library students even really know to ask about tenure track or rank or what the difference is like even know to look for that Right, and I think those are conversations you should be having with your resident. These are the, the options, these are the opportunities, and this is how, if you're interested, we can support you towards those works and those opportunities. Um, you know, my own experience, um, I'm from an immigrant family, I'm the only one with a master's degree, and as of a couple of years ago, I'm the only one with a second master's degree in my whole family. Um, when I was asked by three of my librarians, I, and I worked at a university library for nearly four years as a college student. Um, I didn't think about graduate school. It was not something I was considering in any way, shape, or form. But my boss and a new librarian who was about, a, I think, a year older than me and a retiring librarian that, of that year um, all asked me what I was doing after college. And I just blinked at them. And the retiring librarian actually said, well, you're really good at this. And so did my boss and the other librarian. Um, and that's when I took a deeper look. And without the support of the librarian, uh, the retiring librarian, uh, I, I would not have figured out how to fill out that application. Um, she literally drove me to the University of Pittsburgh and gave me a tour. And without their support, I have no idea where I would be, but I would not be a librarian. Okay. Well, thank you for that story. And we have two more comments that I want to make sure get read. Uh, Mary uh, follows up with, we also cannot underestimate the impact of the residents, the residents, and the that residence and the residency, there we go, can have on the organization itself if we are open to it. And then Twana said, um, helping them to identify opportunities inside and outside of the library and how best to utilize their time, I think in response to a comment that we had earlier while we were chatting. Yeah, and I think most organizations keep a, a laundry list of uh, a wish list of things that we wish we could do higher towards that or free up someone to be able to do that and then a resident can do that substance of work and build their CV. All right, well, we're coming up on the one minute mark. Um, if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free. Uh, it has, um, email address is on the slide or um, you can email me. Um, thank you so much, Nikas. This was incredibly informative. Um, we're so thankful that you took the time out to participate and um, help us out with this today. I've certainly learned a lot myself. Um, and we'll go ahead and head on out. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.